Hi everybody, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce to you this panel session on opportunities and challenges in collecting and studying uh, national webs. We are lacking one speaker, but hopefully he'll, he'll show up in, in a minute. The panel is organized by Nils Brygger, professor at Aarhus University in Denmark, he sends his uh, apologies, and by me, who will chair the session, together with uh, Valérie Schaeffer, She's professor at University of Luxembourg. And I'm Dita Lawersen, I'm from the Royal Danish Library, heading the Department for Digital Cultural Heritage. And we are joined uh, by some of the pioneers in the fields uh, of studying national webs. So apart from Valerie Schaeffer, who I'm already introduced, this is Keith Tzelski uh, at your left. He is researcher and curator of Born Digital Collections at the National Library of uh, the Netherlands. And then we have Friedel Gerhard. She is researcher at the Royal Library of Belgium and the State Archives of Belgium. And we are lacking right now uh, Daniel Gomez. He is heading the Portuguese Web Archive and his team of developers and researchers. He will hopefully show up in a, in a minute. I saw him earlier. So welcome to you all and to you for partaking today. So the panelists uh, all come from different uh, backgrounds and have different approaches, but we all work on nations uh, on the web. And recently we published uh, this uh, book together with other research fellows with similar interests, and today we'll foreground uh, some of, uh, of this work. So our common focus is uh, the national web one of the largest entities of uh, the web, so not single websites or web entities, but the national web. And we consider the national web as a whole, as an important part of a nation's cultural heritage. And we believe it can be studied in its own right, because studying it can help us understand how the internet and the web has developed within a given nation. The national web is also kind of a back clause for all other types of web entities and activities. So with the national web, you can establish sort of a national baseline of a nation or big or small or flat or deep websites are at a particular moment in, in time. And the national web can also, studies of the national web can also identify some of the patterns of the development of the web and relate them to the web of today. But studying national web also comes with a number of challenges for the researcher. So one of them is uh, that national web archives are biased and messy. Not everything has been archived. It differs from nation to nation how much and what has been archived and for how long back in time. And you can be sure that due to politics, uh, curational practices, technical deficiencies, not everything has been archived. Also, archiving strategies uh, changes over time. So when you're studying nation's web over time, you'll have to take into account that your results may reflect changes in the archive and not changes in what was once online. And typically, national archives are unsystematic, you have no register, and you cannot be sure how close your archive copy is to the original because you have no original to compare with. Another challenge is that uh, one has to decide whether a study should focus only on the web uh, that was on, once online or whether a broader societal, technical, cultural context should be included. So uh, you want to decide what sources you want to, and you may have to use other sources than the archive web if, if there are no archive web. So this could be print media like newspapers, user statistics, oral stories and other type of sources. The last common challenge uh, I'll mention uh, today is uh, that a nation has geographical <coughs> borders, but no geographical borders can be identified on the web. So with an analog uh, newspaper, it's typically bound uh, to, to a, a physical space limited by the nation's border. But on the web, you have to do your delimitation in other ways, by other means. So this was my in the introduction. And in the next uh, five uh, presentations, we'll see how some of these challenges can be addressed. 
and we'll also see all of the opportunities and possibilities there are in contributing to national web histories that acknowledges the specificities uh, of the archived web. And after the presentations, there should be ample time to questions and discussion. So thank you very much, Dieter. So we go we go now from north till south, and my presentation will be yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk today about reconstructing and saving the Dutch national web, and I'm sure, of course, you have all read my chapter on web archiving. Well, I uh, wrote in my chapter in the in the volume Dieter just uh, showed us. I wrote about web archiving before the web archive, and I'm going to to explain in five minutes today. What I, uh, what I try to say with this. So, very, very short on Dutch web history. Why web archiving before the web archive? Well, actually, web archiving in the Netherlands started quite late, and the Dutch national domain started quite early. So already in, in uh, 86, there was a, the, the, the country code top-level domain .nl, and then the first website uh, was published in 1992. And the first website of the world was uh, the, the, that of CERN in uh, Switzerland. And then came the second website was of uh, Slack in the United States. And the third website was the website of NICHEV, the Dutch National Institute for Subatomatic uh, Physics. And so uh, this, uh, this third website, we can say that actually at that moment, one third of the World Wide Web was Dutch. And <laughs> And after I, I, I made this presentation, I heard that uh, the fourth website was also Dutch. So at a certain moment in history, even half of the World Wide Web was Dutch. <laughs> so we have, a really, we have a really rich past. And if you look to the websites here, so the, the website under the, uh, the 1992, that's uh, the, the Doors of Perception. That's the first website in the Netherlands which was made with a graphic, uh, with a graphic outlook, especially made from a mosaic browser. The first uh, graphic browser. On the right, we see the website of Case Huizer. This was the first homepage of the Netherlands, and one of the first homepages uh, of the in, in world history. And uh, he really loved beer, and he wrote on, the, on his homepage about all the, the best beer in the Netherlands. So that's also an interesting thing. Uh, and then under it, there's uh, the, one of the oldest internet providers, actually the oldest internet provider of the Netherlands, Xfro. And today we just got a message that it will be gone within one or two months. So the national domain is really fragile, is really uh, under threat. So um, to study the national domain, of course you can go to web archives, but if there was no web ar ar archiving, how can you study it? Well, the, here's a website in 1994. At that moment there was a student who mapped the whole Dutch web. And he, uh, he created a website which was there under, this was the 10th website in the Netherlands. And because there were no search engines, he just looked around in the internet, talked to people and put all these websites on his website. So he made a web directory of websites in the Netherlands. And these kind of websites are one of the best um, uh, sources for the early web in, in, a, in a country. Well, and then it got out of hand. So at, at the moment we have almost uh, 6 million uh, domain names in the Netherlands and the whole national domain outside of .nl is around 9 million uh, 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 websites. So there's really quite a lot, especially if you think about it, that web archiving in the Netherlands started only in uh, 2000 uh, with a, a web archive of political parties and then we as KB started in 2007 with web archiving. So at that moment there were already more than 2.5 million websites. So now we have 0.60% of all websites in the Netherlands we have archived in our collection, so that's not much. So web archiving before the web archive. Well, actually what the Dutch library did before they started web archiving was the same as the students I told you about. 
they made a web directory of all the websites in the Netherlands. And there were three librarians that were just put in a small office, and the whole day they were searching on the net and looking for Dutch websites and put them in a web directory. Well, and I think this is one of the, 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 the richest sources in the Netherlands on the early Dutch web. And we found the web directory on a CD-ROM, and, and so we can now reconstruct the Dutch web from the 90s. Uh, this is an example of another uh, early provider, which is uh, gone now. But these old providers uh, mostly have lists of home pages which were published there. And this is also a very rich source uh, to see what was there on the web, and you can see if, uh, if eventually it's somewhere archived. Uh, and then the last example, what I will say, and then uh, that uh, will be the end of my uh, lecture. So uh, it's not only important to look to, uh, for the national domain and websites, but you can also look for old web archives. And I'm going to present now the oldest web archive in the Netherlands. So this is actually the oldest uh, Dutch literature magazine, online Dutch literature magazine. It uh, started in 1994. And um, this person, he, uh, he made a, a website full of stories, books, everything, what you can imagine, but all digital. But if you, see, you look in the middle, you see a very small sign, De Winkel, which is, um, which is uh, the, the, the translation in English is The Shop. And if you look there, there's a small floppy disk. And in this, uh, if you click on the floppy disk, you see The Shop, and what you see is also zips on your right. And then, when you click on that, you see a, a complete list of all the web archives, what they made of their site and some other sites. And actually, this is the oldest web archive from the Netherlands, which is, uh, which is still uh, uh, present uh, uh, on, the, on the website in the Internet Archive. So actually, it started as a, as a, as a zip. Uh, 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 which was put on the, uh, which you could order on the website on a floppy. So when I first found in the Internet Archive and I found this floppy, I I sent a message uh, to the to to, to uh, everyone on social media. Please, is there anyone who has this floppy? Because this is the oldest web archive from the Dutch national domain in the Netherlands, and it would only cost me ten guilders, and I get one megabyte of uh, of Dutch history. Well, and then actually, it turned out, when I met this person, that this whole floppy did never exist. It was an idea, it was a virtual web archive, but, but because no one ever ordered this web archive on floppy, it never, it never existed in the real world. The only moment when it started to exist was when I uh, got in contact with this person and he copied the contents of his old hard disk for me and gave it to me. So in this way, web archiving before the web archive, you can also do web archiving even after the web archive and often the national parts of the national domain are lost already. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. <laughs> Shall we leave the questions or? We can have a short question. Okay. short questions? No? Then I think we can get over to Belgium. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fido Gerard and I work for the uh, State Archives and the Royal Library of Belgium. And uh, I'm very happy to be here today as the youngest IABC member uh, and talk to you about the chapter Sally Chambers and Peter Michon, so my colleagues from the University of Ghent, and I wrote entitled Towards the National Web Archive in a Federated Country, a Belgian Case Study. Uh, a short history of the Belgian web. So in 1988, the .pe domain was created, and in 1994, we had a big success because we had 129 uh, registered .pe domains. It continued to grow, and uh, some local, more local domains were added, uh, or local domains were added, such as Flanders and Brussels. We also have .kent now. And uh, today we have 1.6 million .pe websites, uh, 6,300 Flanders. Domain names and 7,700 Brussels domain names. So there is definitely enough material to work with. 
Uh, however, if you look at the Belgian web archiving landscape, there are two terms that kind of identify it, namely fragmentation and small scope. Uh, this is a geographical representation of all the small web archiving initiatives we were able to identify so far. Uh, as you can see, it's very fragmented and we really need a national strategy because most of these archives focus on uh, local uh, themes uh, or on very specific social movements. So we're missing out on a lot of uh, content. So this is where the PROMISE project comes in. Um, it's a collaboration between the State Archives and the Royal Library and uh, the Universities of Kent and Namur uh, and the uh, Haute École Bruxelles Brabant. And the main aim is to set up a, a strategy for the archiving of the Belgian web. I won't go into a lot of detail about this project because I have another presentation about it in about an hour and a half. I don't want the room to be completely empty. Um, so, uh, the reality of Belgium is, if you want to study the early Belgian web, you have to either turn to existing web archives, for example, Internet Archive and also the Portuguese web archive have some Belgian pages, thank you very much for that. Uh, and Common Crawl is also a possibility, but they only started seven years ago, so there's not a lot of material to work with. So, uh, one of the best options we discovered so far uh, to study the Belgian web from the early 90s was to, as did mentioned, if we don't have a web archive, we need to turn to paper sources. So we found this publication, the Belgian web directory, it's basically a list of URLs that were thought to be useful to Belgian internauts in the late 1990s. Uh, we're currently preparing a paper for RISO, uh, for it, so if you want more information about that, come check us out in a few weeks in Amsterdam. Uh, however, we aim to do better in the future, so in 2019 KBR became an IIPC member, so that's a step in the right direction towards a national Belgian web archive. Uh, it also became part of the strategy of KBR for 2019-2021, so it looks promising. And we really hope that in 2020 we will be able to kick off the official web archiving program at KBR. For the state archives, uh, we still have to wait the, the decision of the uh, board of directors, uh, but we really hope to be able to convince them to continue this collaboration between the Royal Library and the state archives to contribute to a Belgian web archive. Uh, so thank you very much. This was it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. So basically we do, every three months we collect mainly the .pt domain plus some user suggestions so everybody can suggest a site to view our web archive by us and we also do some selective crawling every day of 361 um, selected websites. We have start uh, doing also some uh, special crawls of events such as elections and recently we also began to do some high quality crawls and these are done on demand. But I'm going to talk here about an attempt to archive the .pt, the .eu domain. So that was, that is what I, what I show is our normal work, and this was a, an experiment. So in the beginning, we tried to do a, a special collection um, to preserve research and development project websites at uh, a national and European level. So we created a Google sheet and asked people to contribute but soon we found out that based on the Cordis uh, database, there are over 25,000 projects. So this began quite uh, a challenge to try to identify all these URLs. So we thought naively that if you archived all the .eu domain, starting from the initial seed list that we had compiled with the Google Sheet, probably we're going to get most of the research and development web projects. We could get some clutter, but we will get most of the, the research and development projects. So we did three crawls. Um, one was in 2014, and one in 2016, and another one in 2017. So in the end, when we got 225 million files, around 20 terabytes of data. So all this information is searchable and accessible, so you just have to go to this URL and try it, it's full text searchable. 
And after we did this indexing, we found that uh, things were not, uh, didn't work as we expected. So the .eu domain, despite our initial seeds being carefully selected, is full of web spam. So we, the, the results were very relevant when you search here. So we have a, a lot of spam and a lot of irrelevant sites. So we then adopted a different approach, smarter one, in which we used the information from the U Open Data Portal and got pick up that metadata and went automatically to search engines using the Bing, the Bing API from Microsoft and tried to get those sites that were still alive um, and crawl them. So doing a more targeted um, crawling. And after we finished this work, we found that only 29% of the URLs were actually under the .eu domain. So just to summarize, we, you can search and use our three crawls of the .eu domain, but we'll not continue to do that because it does not serve our purposes. So, all the information that we have is publicly available, so people can study it. Um, and our main community is research and education. Um, so our service is provided by the Foundation for Science and Technology, so the name says almost everything. So. But for researchers to use web archive content, they must have some, in, some training. So we have three main models that we provide training. If you want to check the models at archive.pt slash training, you can check them. For instance, this is for any user to know how to use a web archive. This is for people that publish information to know how to publish information so that it can be preserved for future access. And this is for people that want to develop new tools using a web archive. Um, these are just some research use cases. You can check them here at thekeep.pt slash research. So now we have this, at least these three stories from the communication studies, information science, and social sciences. There are also some videos there, so they can be expiring, inspiring. So here are, you cannot see, but here are the links to, the, to, the, to, the, to each of, of these pages. Um, so this this was an initial project that we called Investiga 21, means Research 21. So the idea was to, to, in some way, training the researchers for the 21st century and also the researchers that want to study the content published during the 21st century, since it is quite um, difficult to make an accurate analysis of any event passing, uh, that occurred in the past 20 years without considering the web. And uh, also to, to also uh, potentiate the, the, the study of our national lab and our repository, we have this uh, annual um, award now. It's the first place is 10,000 10, euros, the second place 3,000, the third one is 2,000. So you can check more about it at archive.pt slash awards. Anyone can um, submit a proposal. So the only condition is that they must use archive.pt as a main source of information. Um, you can check one last year also. And thank you very much. Hi everybody, so uh, my chapter drew on uh, the Web90 project, it's a project that we conducted in France uh, from 2014 to 2017. And thanks to a partnership with the BNF, uh, our team has been able to follow the implementation of a full text search within the uh, archives of the, 19 and, uh, of the 90s and uh, has benefited from data extraction and thus we began an, uh, an exploration which will develop over time in unexpected ways. And so I want to um, underline some results of small uh, experiences we um, had uh, during this project. The first one is the experience of researchers who have constantly to adapt their methods because where archives and uh, tools are constantly evolving. And this is, of course, a bit disturbing during a project. You start with a methodology, and then a few months or a few years 
After that, you have to totally change your methods. The second point I want to underline is the need for collaboration with uh, archiving organization, and I will try to demonstrate why. And the third point is about the value of what I call medium reading, which is a mix between close and distant reading. So first of all, the need of constant adaptation. When we started our project in 2014, we really had to face a blind reading within uh, internet archives. We could only search through URLs, and as uh, Friedel, uh, for example, uh, mentioned, we had to use uh, directories, or we also had to cross a lot of archives to know which um, URLs we wanted to retrieve within Internet Archive. But this was also a very interesting time because we made also a lot of oral history and we made a lot of people who had developed uh, some uh, old uh, websites. And for example, this website, 42.org, is one of SkyFi. It was developed by two um, people who are really uh, fans of uh, science fiction. And in Internet Archives, the archive began in 2000, but in fact, they had a whole history of their website and they had also personal web archives and we discovered that they had started in 94 uh, and that uh, the version that was archived by Internet Archive, uh, six years after that, was the third version of their website. So we were totally uh, involved in a close reading of web archives and uh, we had uh, this uh, blog post about uh, small is beautiful. It was a small is beautiful period, but then BNF changed the rules because uh, they uh, provided us with statistic, metadata, and full search into web archives. So we had to be very flexible, and after two years of an hard, warm, comfort zone that we had uh, really uh, win, we had to change our methodology and to try what is called a kind of distant reading based on statistics, metadata, and so on. But discussing with BNF, we discovered several things. First of all, we were really impressed because we found that the Wanadu, for example, dot .ifair website has something like 200,000 uh, URLs. And we are thinking, wow, that's wonderful. And then we discovered it was just 10 web captures of website because as researchers we can't imagine that URLs, we think it's a website or a web page, is just a small component of a page. So this claim for trading zone for a common language with archivists. And the second point, we discovered that BNF had retrieved three months per year of the internet archives which were already very partial or selective in the 90s. And then we had to think, but if we map this, what are we mapping? Are we mapping the web of the 90s or just the archived web of the 90s, which is a very, very uh, small part of it? So here is the platform we had to work with BNF, providing statistics, explaining us also the language, what is a work file and everything. So this was very useful. Here are all these uh, amazing statistics and this full text search we were able to do. But we finally decided that a decent reading for the web of the 90s was not convenient for us, that it was just mapping web archives and was not enough representative of, of course, uh, the web of the 90s. But it allowed us to go also uh, in the code and, for example, to discover uh, the uh, paths, which are the hyperlinks and the way we can follow or try to discover missing web archives thanks to the links that were uh, made between some uh, websites. So, so, to conclude, I will um, um, claim for two things. First, a constant dialogue with web uh, archive organization, which will allow us to understand the possibilities, but also the limits, of course, of web archives. And the second point is a claim for a medium reading. Franco Moretti developed the idea of a distant reading based on big data, and we have a kind of big data within web archives. But our experience of close reading uh, gave us the uh, feeling that the medium reading, which is a medial reading between small and big data, but also a reading which uh, keep in mind the um, qualities of the medium and its context is probably uh, the best uh, 
point. And so I finish with this quotation by Jane Winters. Uh, for most humanities scholars, it will be a very long time before they, they transition to using solely digital sources. They will continue to mix and match, to compare and contrast, and to work with overlapping sets of material. And I would say uh, it's a real asset. And uh, yeah, it's probably also this mixture between close and distant reading the way we can have a very interesting historical reading. So we need to go to presentation number five. Thank you. So my talk is about establishment of a corpus of the archive web, and I'll share some results from a research project on the history of the National Danes web. Overall, overall in this project, our aim is to analyze the historical development of the entire Danish web domain and to develop big data methods on the archive web and to establish methods to create a corpus. The data material we are using is uh, from the Danish web archive and we are using the library's small uh, supercomputer to process the data and we are a project team of researchers and developers and the fact that we started in 14 should tell you that a project like this is not easily done. So our overall research question is how, what ha has the Danish web, web looked like and how has it developed over time and we have a, a long list of uh, sub-questions concerning size, space, structure, vivacity, and, and uh, content. And this slide is showing uh, our overall uh, workflow. So we start with the research questions, then we do the extraction of the materials from the archive to be able to work on it on our supercomputer. <coughs> then we need to do some uh, data cleaning, it's necessary. And then we create a corpus, and I'll come back to this, but it's to create um, a corpus of what exactly we want to study. And then the analysis, and then the dissemination, and then the long-term preservation of uh, the research data. And this is, of course, an, an iterative uh, process. So let's zoom in on the corpus creation. The corpus creation is necessary because we don't want to study the archive. We want to study the national web. And for that, we need to create a corpus within the archive to get as close as possible to what was once online. So we started uh, with um, uh, taking a slice from every year. We used the first broad crawl from each year uh, over time. And then next, uh, we wanted to reduce the bias in the archive, that parts of domains may be harvested more than once. So you know that the crawler will go to its designated URL and start to craw crawl the start URL and it will follow the start URL's links. And some of these links might link back to URLs already crawled and crawl them again. Uh, so in that way, uh, you'll get um, that parts of domains are harvested more than once. And that really skew, it will screw up your results because you can see but the crawler will also find URLs from, another, from other domains and URLs from domains not designated to the crawler's job but to a later job like this and, and like this. So what you have in the archive are more versions of the same from different point in time and we didn't want that. We wanted only one version of a domain and the most complete one by either adding some of the by-harvest material or by extracting some of the by-harvest material that were too much to begin with. So why go through all the trouble? Well, it turns out it actually makes a, a big uh, difference. So this is the size of the Danish web with the first broad crawl uh, each year in, in terabyte. And as you can see, the Danish web is much bigger based on the unfiltered corpus compared with the filtered corpus. So this is 40, 40 terabyte in, in 15 compared to uh, 20 terabytes in, in 15. And this is just by reducing all of the, some of the uh, uh, extra materials. And another reason for the, for the difference here is of course also the deduplication because the deduplication takes place 
after the creation of the crawl logs, but before the creation of the full text index. So, um, yeah. And the differences between the two uh, corpora also increases gradually over time because the amount of the content in the archive increases, which also increases the changes of duplicates. duplicates. And the influence of deduplication becomes very obvious uh, when studying the distribution of file types. So these are images, and you can see from the first year the light gray one, so it's the unfiltered um, compared with the filtered corpus. So to uh, sum up, archives are biased, but this can be uh, mitigated by creating a, a corpus, and a filtered corpus should be able to generate the most valuable results compared to an unfiltered corpus. And the method for creating the corpus is very important and greatly influences results. So the two methods that we saw, they might show the same overall result, that the Danish web is growing, but the actually resulting um, uh, numbers uh, differ. And we do know, not know the importance of all the factors that might influence the results. So we talk now about by harvests and deduplication, but there are, of course, other factors. I'll skip this one. Um, this is my last slide. The complex nature of the archive web makes the establishment of the corpus within a web archive a very complex undertaking. So it's imperative for researchers to acquaint themselves with the specific digital nature of the archive web in general, as well as with the characteristics of the web collection that is uh, studied. And this is not just uh, desk research, because not all has been documented, or very little has been documented. And uh, you might have to have a continuous dialogue with curators and, uh, and IT developers. And also, of course, uh, documentation of all the choices made during the corpus creation is very important. So we did this corpus al algorithm, and we documented uh, it all in order for other people to use it, but also to be able to reproduce it and uh, it, its results. Thank you. So thank you to all of you. And before uh, I give the um, audience uh, the floor, I want just to underline some few points. We saw uh, that historians start studying the web before web archives, and this is, of course, a very interesting and challenging thing. We saw the place of amateurism and also of a kind of handicraft uh, method. This is also interesting. We are uh, always between uh, Handicraft and amateurism and science too, as researchers, it's very yeah uh, hard to to find a very strong methodology, and we are working on this. We saw the importance of uh, documenting corpora, and I totally agree with you. And even if we have to say, okay, we had we started a corpora, and then we moved, and we changed the methodology and everything, but this is also something very relevant. We saw also that there are European challenges. It's not only about the .eu that uh, Daniel uh, underlined, but also uh, we have not a totally clear idea of national domains, but what about the European webosphere? This is something which is also uh, probably forthcoming. We should join forces together. And uh, of course, we uh, missed some questions, and they may come uh, from the audience. But there is a lot also to um, study uh, um, on uh, multilingualism, for example, and uh, the Belgium uh, web archives have to deal with it, for example. We didn't mention uh, what about the dot com and uh, some of the uh, we national domain have also to include, or all have to include this dot com, so it's also a challenge. So there are a lot of, uh, of questions uh, there. I want to ask just my colleagues um, about new perspective. What is the next step? Do you have new perspective in studying national uh, domains, things you would like to conduct or to, uh, 
to do, and then we will open the discussion. So, Keith, for example, what is the next step for you? Yeah, well, actually, I, one, one thing I didn't tell you. So, we do not have a legal deposit in the Netherlands. So, in this way, we cannot uh, conduct a, a national domain crawl. So, this, is a, the, the, this was my biggest problem when I started to work on the Dutch national domain. So, I had to find all kinds of ways to c collect material without actually doing a real domain crawl and without web archiving. But what we are doing now, so we, are, uh, uh, we, we try now to, to change the law, but, but to change the law, people have to see what we are doing. It's not enough to say that we are the only country in the world next to Switzerland who do not have a legal deposit. So what we're going to do now is that we, we chose a very small territory in the Netherlands, which is uh, called Friesland, it has its own language, which is actually endangered. It has its own internet top-level domain, .frl. And the people there are very proud of their heritage and very proud of their digital heritage. So we're going to, ar to uh, crawl that domain. We're going to archive that national web domain. And before it, we're going to map it. So I'm, I'm really using also the, the, the Danish examples and uh, the met your methodology and uh, working on a very detailed plan and it will be, for us, this plan and the conducting of this plan and the, the crawling and, and the preserving of 15,000 websites is, it will be a, the next step to a full national domain crawl. So we, we hope that if we do it in this way, a very small scale, and perhaps we, we ask all the, the, the website owners for their permission and then we, we can scale it up to the Dutch national domain, which is 9 million websites. Thank you, Keith. Friedel, the law has already changed in Belgium, so next steps is to grow with this uh, new frame. Uh, well, let's say that we have a, a royal decree that allows us to create inventories of websites, but according to our legal uh, expert, that uh, phrasing is too inaccurate, well, or too you know, vague. Uh, so the idea is, uh, one of the tasks of the project, the PROMIS project, is that we would um, make recommendations for changing the legal deposit legislation and integrate the notion of uh, web crawling via automated uh, means. Um, only then will we, according to the legal uh, expert, uh, have the base, a legal basis to have a legal deposit legislation for web content. So that's one of the things we would really like to get started on because, as Keith says, it's very difficult without uh, to do uh, domain crawl, uh, national domain crawl. Uh, an additional problem for us is that so far our registry is uh, not really forthcoming with the zone file for the .be domain, uh, so that's an impediment. It also caused some delay in the project, so uh, our technical uh, staff members they uh, try to compile as exhaustive a list as possible via extraction of .be domain names from Common Crawl, uh, from DBpedia. We also looked at UIP localization, but we only got, I think, about 600,000 uh, of the 1.6 uh, .be domain names, so that's quite limited. So that's definitely a point we want to uh, look into further, and one of the legal recommendations could be to follow the example of France and uh, Denmark uh, that the registry is required to uh, give the Royal Library that information. So that's one of the avenues. And I think, uh, well, we're still very much at the beginning compared to my fellow panel members. So uh, I think with these two first initial steps, it will be already a big leap forward for Belgium. Thank you. Daniel, uh, Archivo.pt is a not an exception, but it is open. We must keep that in mind, and this is very precious. We can access it yeah, um, online easily. And you are also dealing with visual uh, staff at this stage, no? Uh, no, or visual search or search so for images, I think. Yeah. yeah. There was a presentation from my colleague about that. But yeah, now we support also image search. Uh, and we're trying to <coughs> start collecting also richer content like YouTube but, or, or stream videos, but you're doing that on an on-demand basis. We're also using browser, so we're trying to adapt our web archive to, to the web because the web keeps on evolving. And <coughs> if we don't follow that pace, we'll be doing a, a, a incomplete work and afterwards, when somebody wants to access the web archive to some kind of research, they're going to be quite disappointed. Uh, 
web users and researchers in general are very, very demanding because they are very used to high quality services like uh, Google or Facebook from these multi-million companies that have thousands of people working there. So it's quite hard sometimes to convince researchers to study the information that we have because, for instance, if a given search takes more than 10 seconds, they'll just close it and go away. So the, the requirements to provide access in, in, from the users is, are quite high. So opening access is just a small beginning of a very long and demanding journey. <coughs> Thank you, and Dieter, uh, you already achieved a lot as you uh, showed us, and uh, you also have a strong uh, tradition of collaboration with researchers, with Niels Brugger and uh, his team, for example. Next steps, next switches for your collections and web archives? Well, we're still, for, for this uh, project, we have been working several years with the Metrologypy, and, uh, and we are still struggling with this. We, are, we use the full text index in this, but next we'll use, uh, or, or right now actually, we're using the crawl, crawl logs instead. And it turns out it's, it's probably a, more, a better way of, of doing that. So we'll develop this and then we'll run all our questions. Now we have the algorithm and get amazing results, uh, I'm sure. And then we also hope that the algorithm will be, will be used by there are a lot of uh, new possibilities perhaps for mapping national domain names that are opening or will open uh, within the next years. And now the floor is yours. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for uh, the speakers, so please just ask. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, Colin Rosenthal, Denmark. Uh, I think it's fascinating but also slightly worrying that to see how crawl logs have become so, so central to answering these research questions. That these things that we gather as a, these metadata we gather as a byproduct of the archiving process uh, have actually become really critical for, for how we uh, analyze these archives. So the question I have is, what should we be thinking from what you've learned up to now? What should we as developers and curators be thinking about what kind of metadata we really should be gathering so that when we come back in 10 years' time and researchers want to extract a corpus from what we're harvesting now, there'll, there'll be a, a slightly more support built in from the start for, for doing that. I really don't have an answer for that. So we, 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 we had this project and we had to, to work with what was there, the crawl logs. But I could maybe redirect the question because the Belgium case, they are just starting up and they uh, had the chance to do everything right from the beginning. <laughs> so maybe not on crawl logs, but I know you've been done a whole state, uh, state of the art review of all the web archives and uh, yeah, so, so, so what are your takeaways from all of that and have you thought about um, well, our study, we did a study, we interviewed, um, I think, representatives of 14 different institutions in Europe and in Canada, and uh, indeed, uh, one of the takeaways we had was that uh, there was not enough attention to the user needs, or research needs, so um, we wanted to uh, be ambitious, and in our technical and functional requirements, we stated things like we need to have uh, data level access, we need to provide derivative files uh, so people can do fun stuff with Gephi and so on. Uh, but then we run into copyright issues and uh, uh, more practical matters such as oh, uh, the, the project money or the project will last until December 2019, so that's until the end of this year. We had some delays, calls, so we really need to be practical now and see what, what's feasible. We are aware of what we could do better but unfortunately there's the reality as well of having limited time. So that's why we really hope to make it a more sustainable service so that we can apply these lessons and try to do things right in certain domains from the start. And about the crawl logs, I can tell you a state secret from the Netherlands. There had been conducted a national domain crawl in 2000, but the results were just thrown away because they took too much space but some of the crawl logs are preserved. And this is the only information we have on the national domain 
how how big it was on the base of the of the of the of what the crawler did. So uh, and an another thing is that um, there was a research group who uh, who used our web archive to to do research, and Anat is also perhaps here, in the, in the, in the, but she also was a part of that research group, and they really used our crawler logs to see. Uh, which websites were not crawled but still could be detectable uh, on the basis of the core logs. So in this way you can have a kind of ghost web on the basis of this kind of technical information. And the ghost web is really important to... to you, so you need to have the archive web, but you also need to have the, the... you need to know which part you did not archive due to technical or other errors <coughs> or other issues. Another question? Yeah, there are plen plenty, or there are several questions, so the microphone is coming uh, to you. Thank you. Um, yeah. right. So, um, uh, the, the session is about national webs, but uh, uh, my impression was that most of you concentrated on national domains, and uh, I remember a study from Portugal that uh, only 50% of the national web are actually in the national domain. So um, how do you deal with this in your studies about the national web uh, that probably 50% of all the web pages are not in the national domain? Can, can we just like, uh, just to make a comment on the logs issue and you know, less answer Tobias' question. So um, the thing is that from our experience, researchers, they, they, they many times ask us for the crawl logs because they're not interested on the whole domain, they're interested in analyzing given sites, given set of sites. So uh, for them, like one example is, uh, there's a group that is trying to improve the website of the Diary of the Republic. So it's the official journal where all the laws are published. And they want to have the logs so that they can do this work because they want to analyze broken links and things like that. So. And, and for them, the, as the word changes across time, and the diary has also changed across time, for them the logs is very important, the crawl logs. So I'd just like to give you a message that is, take care of your logs in the same way that you take care of your work files. And, and, and mostly the access logs. The access logs are gold. So basically, and this is something we are not, we are not doing very well. So we're, don't take us for example, this is a concern that we have. Because for instance, for, for Google, the search logs are much more precious data than the web pages that they crawl because we, based on that you can do the algorithms and you can do a lot of analysis across time. So we should do this from the, from the start. So take care of all your logs. Access logs, crawl logs, or other kinds of logs. So regarding Tobias' question, so in our case, we started by uh, our, our life got easier. So when I started working on this, um, it was really hard and expensive to register the .pt domain. You must have a, a, a trademark to register it. And then the law changed, and now it's much easier. So the, 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 the amount of, of information that is under the .pt domain has grown. So this, in our case, the problem is um, less complicated. But still, what we do, or what we have been doing, like we use web directories that have sites related to a given subject like Portuguese blogs, and they're on all domains. So we use this as seeds. We also have the, the thematic collections. So when you do, for instance, a collection on the elections, it gets sites from whatever. So unfortunately, most of them now come from Facebook. Um, but, but this, just to answer that, we, we, the, the, the .pt domain is just the, the, what you call the core. And then we also configure our crawler to go at least one op off around. So the near neighbors are also crawled. So we're trying to address this, um, well, the best that we can, but we are, we are very aware that a lot of interesting stuff are outside of the, of the domain, the national domain. And I, I well, I agree, and uh, it is actually a broader scope than just the country code uh, top level uh, domain, and, and it needs to be a broader scope because we have all these variations between the countries. So in the Netherlands, we have the Frisian uh, domain and the ML domain and dot Amsterdam. And <coughs> in some countries, the, top, uh, the country code uh, uh, top level domain 
is not used very much, like the U.S. in the U.S. Uh, so, so it has to have a broader scope. It's it's a national web, uh, but not only the the, the country code. We just have three minutes left, if I'm right, so we will move to another question. Please, I'm sorry for shortening the answers too, but uh, uh, who wanted to ask a question? Please, I saw several, yeah, please. Hi, um, my name is Aida, and I'm from Singapore. Uh, I have a question for Daniel regarding the training courses of web preservation. Um, there's a course for publishing preservable, preservable information on the web for web authors on your slide. Um, I'd like to know what is the participation rate for this kind of uh, courses for web authors because um, when web authors create websites, they don't do it with the intention of preserving. Um, so they're doing it for, for commercial interests or for um, other interests, you know, for their own interests. Their agenda is not for preservation. So. Um, how is the sign-up rate for such training courses, and uh, how did you even convince them to come if there are a lot of people who sign up for these courses? Okay, so this is the training courses. They are provided for free at the national level. So we have a budget. When the budget ends, uh, we have to... It, it never happened so far because we don't have that many trainees, but people are quite interesting. So basically, are quite interested. So as everybody that has a website, or is responsible for, for the communications of a given organization, they are at least interesting to know a little, a little bit about it. So it has been for free in Portugal, but we already did an experiment on and spending that internationally, and we did that uh, as a tutorial at the TPDL conference last year. It was in Porto, in Portugal, so we also went there. Um, and now we've been also doing this, to, this, this training uh, uh, as webinars. So this is also an option. So basically anyone that might be interested, what the only demanding that we have is a minimal number of people attending at national level. And at the webinar, obviously also like a minimal number of, of attendees. And the recommendations are online. So, and also some videos and some webinars. So if I'd like to take a look, just have to just go there and, and see. So it's time to conclude. And uh, before giving the last word to uh, Dieter, I really want to thank all the speakers, and Dieter especially, uh, and Liz Brugger, they both organized this panel. To remind you about the book, you will find a lot about Jen Winters and Ben David with Keynote Tomorrow, for example, Jan Milligan uh, with uh, there too, also contributed to the to the book, so keep it in mind. And Dieter, the last words are for you, if you if you wish. I don't think we have time, but thank you, Valerie, for facilitating this uh, last uh, part, and thank you all for participating, and thank you to the panelists. <laughs>